In 2009, Professor Stefan Hoffman gathered 202 willing volunteers for a somewhat unusual experiment in his lab. He asked them one by one to simply step up in front of a camera and spend 10 minutes speaking without any prior preparation about three topics. The war in Iraq, the mandatory seatbelt law, and the death penalty. Upon arriving in the lab, they were told that the quality of their speech would be reviewed by experts, and throughout the speech, they would have their heart rate monitored. As expected, this induced some strong feelings of anxiety. And so he gave the participants three different strategies to manage it. He told one group to just suppress any negative feelings, to try as hard as possible not to let any signs of anxiety be displayed outwardly. He told another group to simply accept the negative feelings, to not fight them in any sense. And then he told the third group to do something a little different. He told them to... Okay, so before we finish that little story, let's talk a little bit about definitions. You see, anxiety is a term that is very popular nowadays, and it's likely you've come across it in a million different places, which is largely a good thing. But it can also lead to a little bit of confusion because we don't all necessarily mean the same thing as each other when we talk about anxiety. So let's clear the air a little more. Anxiety is an emotion. It's something that we feel in response to a perceived threat. Your blood pressure rises, your hands feel clammy, you feel worried and tense. And it is an adaptive behavior. It's designed to signal the potential of a threat. But for some people, this process can get a little bit out of hand, whether it's the frequency of anxious thoughts or the intensity of them. When anxiety reaches a point where it interferes with your day-to-day -day life, it may be possible that you have an anxiety disorder. Think, for example, about social anxiety disorder or generalized anxiety disorder. And those are best treated by medical professionals. I want to focus more on the state of anxiety, which can also sometimes stop us from doing things we want to do. It can be a barrier to public speaking or making friends, or even picking up a new hobby, for example. And so I want to ask you, what do you think is the best way to deal with feelings of being anxious? Well, it turns out that if you ask most people, they'll likely tell you to calm down. Unfortunately for us, trying to stifle emotions often can have a bit of a paradoxical effect and augment the intensity with which we feel them. But that doesn't mean that we have to give up and resign to being powerless against feelings of anxiety. And Stefan Hoffman's experiment shows one way that we can deal with it. Hoffman asked the third group of participants in his study to use a technique called cognitive reappraisal. Let me explain how it works. If I asked you to describe the physical aspects of anxiety, you might say things like a high heart rate or feeling sweaty and clammy, or generally feeling alert and energetic, what psychologists might call a state of high arousal. But if I asked you to describe a different emotion, say excitement, there'd be a lot of overlap between the two. In fact, the physiological aspects of anxiety and emotion are just very similar. So how can we tell anxiety apart from feelings of excitement then? Well, there's more information at play. We also use context, our own biases, and our overall interpretation of the scenario that we're in to determine to some extent how we feel. This means that even if emotional reactions feel like they're an automatic process, at least some of it is cognitive. It's to some extent within your control. And so one way to kind of regain a little bit of this control is through repurposing the emotion. Another psychologist, Alison Wood Brooks, explains this idea really well. She notes that the physical differences between anxiety and excitement are pretty similar. What changes is the narrative that we construct around those physical feelings. And so what if people explicitly told themselves out loud that they associated the situation with excitement rather than with anxiety? It turns out that they perform better, they feel better, and they're better at handling unnerving situations than they would be otherwise. They can use the physical cues that they have in these stressful situations to instead drive performance rather than inhibit it. This is a better strategy than just trying to calm down. 
because you're not trying to go from a high arousal state to a low arousal state. You're instead changing the narrative you construct around that state. And anxiety is a difficult emotion to deal with. It biases our attention towards threat, danger, and risk. We become disproportionately aware of the dangers of entering into a situation. And cognitive reappraisal can actually reduce the effect of that negative attentional bias. We can start to see the world around us for what it really is rather than what our brains are trying to tell us. And while this technique doesn't necessarily reduce anxiety, what it can do is provide a competing emotion that can instead help us manage it. And there are plenty of good reasons why we can end up in a situation where we can't properly appraise how we feel. Children, for example, from lower socioeconomic backgrounds who've grown up in environments which are more dangerous and threatening can end up more likely to interpret ambiguous situations as being dangerous or seeing hostility where there is little or none. And this is just one factor that affects how we see the world around us. And obviously this isn't a one-stop solution. That's not really the point of this. What I'm trying to get across is that emotions aren't these abstract events that happen to us. There's an element of narrative in an emotion and that means that there's an element of control that we can try to gain back in day-to-day -day life. I see cognitive reappraisal not as a catch-all solution but as one method in a group of methods designed to make me more emotionally intelligent. And for a while now I've been trying to do things that make me feel a bit more uncomfortable in day-to-day -day life whether that's talking to strangers on public transport, picking up new hobbies, and sharing ideas like this on camera. And every time I turn a camera on or I walk into a room where I don't really know anyone, I still get those feelings of doubt that what I'm saying isn't relevant or interesting or that I'm just being annoying or any other myriad of irrational fears. But I'm forcing myself to learn and internalize the fact that my doubts are there to help me and that they don't need to necessarily be stifled down. Rather what I need to do is either verbally or by writing it down or through doing affirmations is to really try to just repurpose that anxiety into something more useful. To me it falls in the same ballpark almost as meditation or journaling might. A strategy amongst many rather than a single catch-all solution to my problems. Because Really, there aren't any magic bullets to things like this. I think the best thing we can do is build up a set of tools, techniques, and experience that can help us kind of wade through life and eventually see a clearer path towards the person that we want to be. What do you think? I hope you enjoyed that. If you want to continue the conversation, you can leave a comment below or you can consider joining our Discord. I'm always very curious to see what people think and I try to read every comment even if I don't reply to them all. So let me know what you think and I hope you enjoyed it. Okay, bye.